My name is Ari Redboard. I am head of legal and government affairs at TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence and anti-money laundering software. Welcome to TRM Talks. TRM Talks is a monthly discussion with policymakers and business leaders in the cryptocurrency space. For decades, policymakers across the globe have increasingly used economic sanctions to disrupt terror networks, limit the spread of weapons of mass destruction, punish human rights abusers, deter election interference, and isolate rogue regimes. While the United States, the European Union, and the United Nations deploy sanctions differently, all three focus on one common goal, cutting off illicit actors from the traditional financial system to prevent them from moving money and buying goods. However, as we move from the fiat world of hawalas and shell companies to the digital world of programmatic money laundering in cryptocurrencies, what is the impact to economic sanctions? How do cryptocurrencies with their promise of speed, pseudonymity, and borderless reach impact nation states' ability to enforce sanctions? How can cryptocurrency businesses and financial institutions build a sanctions compliance response to thwart sanctioned actors and conform with regulatory expectations. Today, TRM Talks is joined by two people who know. OFAC's head of enforcement, Lauren Scheinert, and former treasury official and sanctions expert, Eric Lorber of K2 Integrity. Welcome to you both. Before, uh, before diving into sanctions, um, I, it would be great to have folks hear about your journeys to crypto. How how, how did you get interested in crypto? How, how are you thinking about it today? Uh, Lawrence, why don't we kick things off with you? Sure, happy to kick it off. And first of all, thank you, Ari, for hosting and great to see you, Eric. Uh, really looking forward to this chat and really great to, to see you guys. Um, just by way of introduction, um, I'm the Associate Director for Compliance and Enforcement at the Office of Foreign Assets Control, uh, which is the unit within the Treasury Department responsible for administering and enforcing economic sanctions. Um, I do have to note at the top, I'm speaking off the record and not offering official views of the, of the department. Um, but to your question really about sort of how I've been thinking of, of cryptocurrency issues um, over the last several years, before joining OFAC, I had a variety of other roles within Treasury Department. Uh, most recently was a senior advisor to the Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, which is a role I think each of you know a little bit about. Um, and really in that capacity, we focused on a wide range of issues uh, impacting cryptocurrencies, really uh, running the gamut from regulatory, law enforcement, prudential, national security, et cetera. And before that, spent some time at the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, um, which is the anti-money laundering unit within the Treasury Department. So really got to see how the, the money laundering issues uh, really intersected with cryptocurrency. And as you both know, that's a, that's a, a you know, very prominent issue, but increasingly seeing that, that intersect with, uh, with sanctions. Um, and it's, it's interesting when I think about you know, uh, cryptocurrency historically and sort of where we've been uh, many years ago, I can vividly recall when, when first joining Treasury Department, presenting at conferences or being at meetings and you know, we would have a, a discussion of illicit finance issues generally, and cryptocurrency would be one word on one bullet on one page of a 15 slide presentation. And you know, it's, it's fascinating to see where we are today, where it's just such a prominent issue that it just has so many implications of, of why, of, you know, across a wide array of, of, uh, of, of issues and concerns. And so it's really been fascinating to see that evolution. And now that I'm um, focused particularly on the sanctions issue, um, it's, it's really interesting to see how we can use our authorities to you know, combat illicit use uh, in the cryptocurrency space. No, that's terrific. Thank you. Um, and before, before we get to Eric, I would be remiss not to say sort of to, to Lawrence's comment, I, uh, the three of us were all um, lucky enough to be senior advisors to uh, the Undersecretary for Terrorism and Financial Intelligence, Seagal Mandelker. And um, I know sort of had this extraordinary experience really of working with awesome teams from OFAC and FinCEN and, and TFFC and, um, and OIA. Um, Lawrence, unlike Eric and I, are still is still lucky enough to to work with those teams and lead those teams. Okay. But um, I think part of I, I can act, I only speak for myself, but I think it's true of, of you guys as well. And that is, you know, so much I think of how I think about cryptocurrency and sanctions and really the space generally is informed by that experience. And um, you know, there there's a really uh, terrific 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 groups of folks that have had that role. And um, 
you know, TRM talks is, is, is meant to be sort of talking crypto with friends. And it's, it's, it's not, it's, it's never been more true than it is today. So thank you. Thank you both for joining, for joining me. And um, yeah, like uh, I'll kick it to Eric, sort of love to hear about your journey to crypto. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, actually you stole, you stole my intro point, which was just <laughs> to say something like this really is just a, a talk amongst, amongst friends. Lawrence and I were, were together, worked very closely together when we were at Treasury. And, and obviously, Ari, you and I have been, been close since uh, since I left and since you joined Treasury and then since you subsequently left. So it's just great to be here. Um, you know, I'm a comparatively late joiner to crypto. Um, at, at my core, I'm sort of a sanctions nerd. Uh, I'm a heart of, of sanctions through and through. Um, and my sort of focus on crypto didn't really begin until I was actually at Treasury in 2018. Um, now, as you both know, um, our, our former boss, uh, Seagal, the undersecretary, was keenly focused on sanctions evasion. It uh, was a real, really important part of, of what all of us did um, while we were at Treasury and, and issues that we worked on. And I remember in, I think it was March of 2018, um, we, uh, Treasury put out the executive order focused on the Venezuelan cryptocurrency, the Petro. And at the time, I didn't know all that much about cryptocurrency, but I saw it through the lens of this is, you know, the Maduro regime's effort to evade U.S. sanctions. How does it work? Is it feasible? You know, what are the risks that we see with it? And that sort of launched what I think was uh, sort of the, the first uh, sort of foray I had into crypto. Now, the Petro as a, as a cryptocurrency really hasn't uh, I guess, thankfully taken off. It was sort of, uh, uh, didn't really sort of go anywhere. But the the sort of the focus on crypto is sort of really, that, that's really where it began for me. And now that I'm back in the private sector, um, I will say that there's just been, as you mentioned, just such a tremendous interest. We have clients coming to us all the time um, with new ideas, new products, new services. And consistently what they ask is, you know, does this abide by U.S. law? Does this abide by U.S. regulation? What are the risks I face uh, related to sanctions exposure? And, and many clients just ask questions about what are the things that are out there that I'm not paying attention to that I need to be paying attention to? No, that's terrific. And it's really interesting you mentioned the Petro. I, I've been thinking a lot about CBDCs recently. And when you think about them, you're focused on China and what the United States is doing in the space. But really, Venezuela, of all places, whatever you think of the Maduro regime, was really out front sort of thinking about a central bank digital currency. So it's really, it's interesting. I don't know if it's talked about enough, um, uh, for sure. Lawrence, you mentioned um, sort of your, your current role as the Associate Director for Compliance and Enforcement. One of the things I always thought was sort of, sort of so interesting about that job and really so cool about it is you have the sort of compliance piece and the enforcement piece. Can you walk folks through sort of like exactly what you do, what your day-to-day -day looks like? Yeah, sure, happy to. Um, so I think it's helpful to start, you know, generally the way we implement sanctions is issue regulations that apply to U.S. persons, right? And that means our regulations apply to all U.S. businesses, not just uh, traditional institutions like banks and others, but importantly, um, you know, uh, cryptocurrency exchangers in the U.S., right? And other U.S. persons that are involved in this industry. And the, the, the overriding theme really of, of the implementation of our regulations is that the success of um, our sanctions programs depends on the private sector implementing those regulations effectively. So really what we wanna do from the compliance side of things is ensure that the private sector understands their obligations, knows what, what the expectations are, and then implements them effectively. And so to do that, um, we have the one side of the house, the compliance side, really engages with the industry uh, very regularly. They answer the hotline. You know, there's a, there's a number you can call OFAC if you have questions, uh, you can send an email, uh, but also they're out there uh, presenting at conferences, engaging with, with industry stakeholders, really meeting with, with uh, those in the industry to, to gather feedback and understand what's happening on the ground and really looking for ways to identify where we can provide more clarity, right? We issued a series of frequently asked questions to, to provide to the, to the industry. And so that's really where uh, the compliance side is, is focused. Now, of course, you know, despite our best efforts, there are U.S. businesses that don't comply uh, with our regulations where they have some sort of failure and, and a violation gets through. And that's really where the enforcement side of things come into play. And so we have a, a very robust enforcement program that investigates, obviously, the full range of, of issues uh, implicating OFAC regulations. And the way we deal with that is we have, there's a range of options to deal with a particular violation. It could be a non-public action, uh, such as a no action letter or a cautionary letter. Um, all the way up to public action, which could be a civil monetary penalty, for example. And really the purpose of these enforcement actions is to promote compliance within the industry. 
right? And so we take great care in our public enforcement actions to articulate what exactly went wrong, what was the compliance breakdown of this particular company, but also what did the company do right afterwards? What remedial measures did they put in place uh, such that others in the industry can look at that and if it makes sense for them, potentially adopt them as best practices if it fits within their risk profile. Um, so we really want each, each enforcement action to be sort of a lesson learned that the industry can take and, and use um, you know, sort of going forward. And in the virtual currency space, we've really um, been active over the last several months. We had our first case uh, come out in December uh, involving an entity called BitGo, which you may be familiar with, and then followed that up in December, in February with another enforcement action involving BitPay. That certainly happy to dive into those, but just to give you a sense of sort of where we're headed on the enforcement side. No, that's really helpful. And we'll get to sort of those specific examples in a second. But before, before I jump to Eric, I think you said something that was really interesting. And that is sort of, we are, um, you, you can learn a lot from our enforcement actions, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. If you could maybe talk a little bit about how you, OFAC right now is thinking about cryptocurrency and sanctions sort of in, uh, on, uh, from a high level perspective. Yeah, so I, I think it, when you think about cryptocurrency and sanctions at a high level, I think it's really helpful to really take a step back and understand why we issue sanctions to begin with. And Ari, you hit this in your introductory remarks, but the whole purpose of, of sanctions really is to address a national security or foreign policy issue targeting um, you know, foreign countries and regimes like North Korea, Iran, uh, terrorist organizations, international narcotics traffickers, people involved in the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, right? And the goal is, um, you know, to compel change of behavior, but also to cut off fundings to ensure that they can't use and move money in ways that harm our national security, right? And that's sort of the overarching, you know, purpose as to why we're issuing sanctions. So then when you get to, um, you know, why it's so important to ensure that companies comply, because if there are compliance failures and there's breakdowns, that makes it more attractive to illicit actors to, to use cryptocurrency to evade our sanctions, right? They're going to seek out the businesses that have weak controls or jurisdictions that don't have effective regimes and try to access uh, the system that way and potentially evade our sanctions. And so that's where we're particularly focused. No, that's terrific. Thank you so much. And, you know, it's so interesting. You have the, the compliance piece, you know, whereas you're trying to work with, with industry to make sure that they're building out sort of robust compliance programs. On the flip side, it's really the same folks, or at least you're heading up the same group that is also thinking about enforcement. Um, Eric, you are on the front lines and sort of the compliance space advising clients to how to really, I don't know, how, how should I say to stay on the good side of Lawrence rather than sort of, you know, on the stick, on the stick side of Lawrence. Um, but how, how are you advising clients right now around, uh, around U.S. sanctions and sort of the way OFAC is thinking about crypto? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, so there are, to take a step back for just a minute on this, there are different types of clients who are coming to us that have different types of concerns, right? And so what we advise them depends on sort of the type of, uh, the type of company. So we see a lot of financial institutions that come to us who are interested in providing banking services to VASPs, to you know, currency exchanges, so on and so forth. And what they are looking for is you know, essentially, how can we get comfortable with you know, X you know, VASP that's, that's implementing this type of risk-based sanctions program? Is that enough? for us as a financial institution to meet our regulatory obligations. So there, what we, you know, the, the types of questions that we see really focus on, you know, what type of diligence are you doing um, for that vast compliance program? How comfortable are you that they're catching um, what, you're, what, what you're concerned about? And then on the flip side, we get a lot of the, you know, the virtual asset service providers coming to us who are actually trying to build out their compliance programs. Because again, as I mentioned, they're not, a, you know, they know they have obligations or they think they have obligations, but they're not exactly sure what that looks like. And they may be trying to do a couple of things. They may be trying to you know, open accounts with specific financial institutions. They may be trying to get funding um, from venture capital firms who are you know, cognizant of their sanctions obligations and sanctions responsibilities. So it really does kind of um, uh, you know, depend on the type of institution that you're, talk you're talking with and speaking with. The one consistent piece that I give to uh, advice that I give to all all of our clients who we work with in this space is um, move slowly and carefully and adopt a risk based approach. I, I can't tell you how many times we've had clients come to us to say, "Well, this is what we want to do, um, and we're really interested in doing it." And OFAC hasn't said anything on it yet, so we're going to assume that it's permissible. 
And I, I counsel clients be cautious with that approach because just because OFAC hasn't necessarily said something is explicitly prohibited doesn't necessarily mean that, that they will come to that conclusion um, uh, down the road. So I think, you know, I know this kind of cuts against a lot of sort of the enthusiasm for crypto in the space right now, which makes a lot of sense and people are all behind it and trying to set up new companies. But I do think that at least as it comes to sanctions compliance, um, a note of sort of caution is is definitely required and necessary. And that's sort of the high level advice that we try to uh, impart to all of our clients operating in this space. No, that's really helpful. And I know you also tell them how important transaction monitoring like TRM is in any sort of, you know. <laughs> exactly. There's uh, no one better than TRM. Programs. Exactly. Yeah, this is not an endorsement, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I think I'm going to dig in a little bit to all that in a moment, because I really think it's important sort of to understand the mechanics as you're advising clients um, in sort of building out an OFAC compliance uh, piece. But um, Lawrence, you started to go into some of the recent cases. And, um, you know, I don't know if you're in a position to sort of opine, but if you can sort of walk us through, maybe you mentioned BitPay and BitGo in, in particular, um, if you can sort of walk us through those, and maybe I'll, I'll have Eric uh, then jump in on sort of opine on maybe lessons learned. Sure, happy to. So uh, as I mentioned, Bitco is sort of the first cryptocurrency focus case um, that we issued in December and then followed BitPay in February. And there's some common themes across both. So maybe I'll just hit sort Perfect. of the highlights and, and then some common uh, compliance considerations. And would certainly refer you uh, at the, on our website, we have very detailed um, facts and factors that we consider. So certainly welcome to check that out. Um, but Bitco, as, as you may know, is a tech company um, that implements security and scalability platforms for digital assets and offers non-custodial secure digital wallet management services, right? Um, and really what, what happened in that case is that you had individuals located in Crimea, Cuba, Iran, Sudan, Syria, all sanctioned jurisdictions. They signed up for accounts and accessed Bitco's plat online platform to conduct cryptocurrency transactions, right? And Bitco had tracked its users' IP addresses for security purposes with respect to account logins but did not use that IP information uh, for sanctions compliance purposes. And so as a result, the users that were located in these sanctioned jurisdictions were able to create and use digital currency, uh, digital currency wallets on Bitco's platform and engage in those cryptocurrency transactions, despite Bitco's ability to identify where they were located. BitPay was, was somewhat similar. Uh, they, had a, they have a different business, but the, the, the general um, issue was, was similar in the sense that uh, you had individuals from sanctioned jurisdictions, again, accessing the platform to engage in digital currency transactions. BitPay uh, is, is more of a payment processing service. And so their customers were merchants that were looking to sell goods and services. And what they did was they allowed people to buy those goods and services using uh, digital currency. And then BitPay would sort of make the, make the conversion into fiat currency and then transfer that to the merchants. And again, what happened is BitPay would screen its merchants, its customers, uh, and conduct due diligence to understand where they were located, but it did not screen the buyers who were accessing the platform to make the purchases, even though it had, in some cases, information indicating um, where they were where they were located. So, you know, I think you know each resulted in a monetary settlement, but I think sort of the main theme and the main point really gets at um, you know what our guidance in the cryptocurrency space has really been trying to emphasize. We included it right up front on, on, on these cases so that it's clear to the, to the industry that OFAC sanctions compliance obligations apply to all US persons, right? Not just banks and other traditional financial institutions, but it applies to virtual currency exchangers, all US persons involved in, in, this, in this space. And we also tried to emphasize that as part of a risk-based approach, getting to what Eric was talking about, is that there is no one size fits all uh, compliance program. It really does depend on the specific risks and the nature of the business, and that needs to be taken into account. And then the, the cases try to provide a little more granularity and color on that theme by highlighting the remedial measures that each company took, because again, those are very important for the industry to see um, if it makes sense for others to look at them as best practices. We want to get that out there and ensure that that's, that's visible. And so we highlighted very specifically the enhanced IP blocking uh, restrictions that the companies put in place, as well as email restrictions related to sanctioned jurisdictions, um, enhancing its compliance resources, including hiring a chief compliance officer, running periodic batch screening, updating record keeping procedures, updating end user agreements so that customers are aware of these obligations, doing a routine review of policies, procedures, updating training, all these things we tried to lay out um, to provide a little more clarity as to what OFAC's expectations are 
in this industry. And I would note that we also mitigated the penalty in those cases because of those remedial measures. And so we, we look at a variety of factors, including remedial measures and the adequacy of a compliance program at the time of the violation. And we take that into account. So a cryptocurrency business that is seeking to comply and has, a, has an effective risk-based program, even if a violation occurs, will be much better place than uh, an institution that does not take compliance seriously from an enforcement perspective. No, that's really helpful. You know, it's interesting. I was a prosecutor for over a decade. And the one thing I was not allowed to do was ever say, send a message to the jury, right? That was how to get a mistrial, you know, uh, immediate <laughs> mistrial from the judge. But it's different in, in policy world, right? You, mm -hmm. an enforcement action is very much intended to send a message. And right. Eric, I'd love to sort of hear from you about sort of what the message of these cases, um, you know, obviously we're hearing about the need to monitor, closely monitor IP address information, um, but I'd love to hear sort of how, how, how do you see these cases and how do you use them to advise clients? Yeah, um, I, I love this question um, because it, it brings me back to an enforcement case that on its face doesn't have anything to do with cryptocurrency or, or the current issues. And that's a, uh, I think it's 2014 Citibank enforcement action. Um, against uh, uh, Citibank for trade finance, a trade finance related sanctions violation. So bear with me for a minute as I explain this because it's all gonna come full circle. Edge of my seat, let's do okay, it. Okay, here we go, here we go. So in that enforcement action, OFAC enforced against Citibank, uh, Malaysia, Penang, because they were processing trade finance transactions and they had the underlying trade finance documentation on hand. And in that trade finance documentation, there were the names of specially designated nationals, SDNs, right, blocked persons. And Citibank did not screen the underlying trade finance documentation. And as a result, and there are a couple other factors as well, but this was probably the most important factor, OFAC took uh, 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 engaged in enforcement activity against Citibank for that action. That is eerily similar in my mind or very similar in my mind to both of the core fact patterns that Lawrence just described um, in these enforcement actions. Essentially, and I'm paraphrasing here because I know it's a simplification, but both of the two companies had the relevant information that there was a sanctioned person or sanctioned jurisdiction involved, right? You had the IP addresses at hand. Um, but clearly they didn't take the steps necessary to ensure that they were screening that information or blocking appropriately. I think the key lesson learned here is you need to look back at OFAC enforcement actions um, to see basically what types of things OFAC thinks of, um, thinks, as, uh, thinks are prohibited or not. In this case, if you have relevant information, be it trade finance documentation or IP addresses, you should be screening it. You should figure out if it presents a sanctions risk to you. And I think the broader point I'll take away here is, you know, the the, the compliance um, uh, the, the the compliance culture within the crypto space is is developing very very quickly. But in some ways, because it's such a new industry, it may be a little bit behind, you know, what the sort of traditional big bank financial institution industry has done over the last four or five years. Because again, you're seeing a situation where this is an enforcement action from 2014 Citibank. Uh, that is the lessons really apply to what Lawrence is talking about for 2020 and 2021 enforcement actions. So I think what you're really seeing, and, and we were talking about this earlier, is kind of the development um, in the maturity, the fast development and maturity of the compliance space in, for cryptocurrency firms. And I think that's going to continue. But uh, I do like these enforcement actions. That's, I won't phrase it like that. <laughs> I think these enforcement actions are very interesting because they illustrate um, just how quickly, you know, the cryptocurrency space has to sort of catch up to a lot of the lessons that have been taught and, and learned in the OFAC space over the last bunch of years. Yeah, no, I, I, it's really, I mean, brilliantly stated too. I, I hear all the time these sort of concerns about sort of crypto businesses as compared to sort of larger financial institutions and their sort of compliance shops. And what I often say is, look, we're pre-first inning here when it comes to crypto. And these these companies are really building out their compliance capabilities, but it is early. And I think to your point, it's sort of like, that's why bringing in really true subject matter experts like yourself are really important, um, you know, as you're trying to make sure that you're, that you're complying. Lawrence, you look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's, it's a great point, really. And I think it also presents an opportunity because it is early in a sense, you know, certainly compared to, to banks, right. Um, and, 
one of the one of the things we like to emphasize is that these compliance features, you know, should be built into the to the architecture at, at the beginning, right? Compliance should not be an afterthought after the business is up and running for a couple of years, and and it should not be at that point to realize, hey, we need a sanctions compliance program. That really should be built in at the beginning. And so, um, I think one of the it it, it presents. It's not just a challenge, but it is an opportunity because, you know, for those those players that are sort of new to the space or the industry is sort of as it grows, it can build compliance sort of in tandem as the business develops itself. And so we want to sort of seize that opportunity. And that's where we want to provide as much guidance as, as we can. Terrific. Yeah. No, Lauren, staying with you for a second. Um, you know, I've been thinking a lot recently. There was a 2018 um, action that was really the first uh, Sam Sam. It was really the first to include crypto addresses. And obviously since then we've seen really OFAC, I think focus really more and more on those addresses because it's a way to stop the movement of funds um, cold in some, in, in some instances. Um, but sort of building from there very recently, um, OFAC designated a number of crypto addresses in a case involving um, Russian election interference. Mm -hmm. um, again, without opining, can you sort of talk a little bit about that case, and then maybe I can um, have Eric jump in to sort of talk a little bit about lessons learned potentially. Yeah, I, I think that's a it's a great case to highlight, as well as um, you know, as we've been doing that more over the last couple of years. But as you noted, identifying digital currency addresses on the list as identifiers of of individuals and and uh, entities that have been sanctioned, um, and we've done this not just in the Russia context, but uh, really in a wide array of of you know, particularly cyber related issues, including ransomware perpetrators, Chinese fentanyl vendors, Chinese crypto launderers, North Korean state actors, and and Russian entities, as you noted. And really, the the purpose of doing that is is twofold. One, obviously, we want to provide uh, as much identifying information. And if transactions are going to these digital currency addresses, we want the private sector to be able to identify that and act on it uh, from a sanctions compliance perspective. But I think the other real value in doing that is that it gives more, <clears throat> more information to the private sector to do lookbacks and identify other connections that may not have been known, right? Because then um, those in the industry can then look at this address and see who else was sending funds to this address that may not have been identified. And to the extent that that information is identified, reported uh, back to the US government, that can be useful in sort of building out the networks of those involved. So there's a couple of different purposes as to why we identify those digital currency addresses. And it's been very effective so far. No, that's really helpful. And Eric, maybe sort of uh, feel free to stick with those sort of Russian sanctions or really this whole idea of uh, adding crypto addresses to the sanctions packages or, or, or the press releases, et cetera. Yeah, so I mean, I, just sort of following up on, on what Lauren said, um, I really agree. And I think that, you know, when we talk to clients, it's, you know, of course you should be screening, you know, those addresses, but that should be, you know, the kind of the first step, definitely not the last step. So you need to be not to screen them, but also trying to identify illicit conduct, you know, throughout your network that may have touched those addresses. Um, as well as any other sort of, you know, potential red flags that, that you're able to see. And, you know, it, it's interesting because I do think OFAC is going to, I'm going to make a, a crystal ball prediction here, Lawrence. I don't think it's a particularly, uh, you know, aggressive one, but I think OFAC is going to continue to list, uh, or, you know, or sanction or provide information about specific um, digital, uh, digital currency addresses uh, that are owned or controlled or the property of, interest, uh, of, of blocked persons. I don't think that's too far out there. Um, but I think that is in many ways just kind of the first step for a compliance program is to be able to screen against those. Yeah. And beyond that, you need to take additional prophylactic steps to make sure that anything they touch um, is, not, is not sanctioned, as well as, you know, there's an entire area outside of those, those specifically identified um, digital addresses that, that is potentially prohibited activity to, to transact with. So again, we talked about this earlier, but, but transactions in digital wallets that are, you know, have IP addresses, for example, in Cuba or Iran or North Korea or Syria, et cetera. So again, I, very important, but I think it's like the tip of the iceberg in terms of what a compliance program is gonna to have to be able to, to, to counter and fend off. No, it's really interesting. And I actually, I thought um, this all really goes to, right? I mean, this was a giant sanctions uh, uh, package, mm -hmm. uh, 16 Russian individuals, 16 entities, and yet, uh, we see really throughout the role that crypto played in it. And I think we're just starting to see it more and more. People talk all the time sort of about, you know, cryptocurrency crime or cryptocurrency activity. It's really, it's, it's potentially in every crime or every activity. And I think we're starting to see that more and more. 
Yeah, can I, can I just quickly follow up? I think that's Wait. exactly right because with, with that designation package, my recollection is the cryptocurrency that was identified was related, uh, pertained, I think, specifically to the, um, the, the supporters of the election interference um, uh, activity in Pakistan, right? So it wasn't, it wasn't the absolute sort of core focus of the designation package. It was something where, oh, we also identified the cryptocurrency that they were using. Um, so I think what you're likely to see, again, crystal ball, is the incorporation of addresses into sort of more kind of, you know, regular actions, maybe not actions that only focus specifically on, you know, a particular individual or entity who's abusing cryptocurrency. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, as part of the executive order around that sanctions package, and I'll, I'll read it to you because I think it's, it's really telling about the way the U.S. government is thinking about crypto and sanctions, um, you know, President Biden in that executive order uh, mentions cryptocurrencies as a tool that may be used to bypass U.S. sanctions. And the executive order states that any individual who uses, quote, deceptive or structured transactions or dealings to circumvent any United States sanctions, including through the use of digital currencies or assets or the use of physical assets, should be blocked from transacting, essentially sanctioned. So it's, um, look, I mean, it's it's here to stay. It's sort of a part of the work that, that we're all doing. And um, yeah, it's it's a really interesting moment for crypto, I think. Um, you, you know, I mentioned at the outset that it's really not the U.S. I think sometimes it feels that way, um, but really it's sort of not just the U.S. in terms of economic sanctions. Lawrence, how could you sort of describe, and this doesn't have to necessarily be just in sort of the crypto space, but how does OFAC work with, you know, foreign partners, the United Nations, EU on sanctions? Sure. Um, so there's a couple a couple parts to that. So more of the general question about how we work with with foreign partners and UN and others. Um, you know, just as a general matter, U.S. sanctions are more likely to to achieve their objective, to compel a change in behavior, um, and disrupt threatening activities when they're done in coordination with with partners and allies. Right. It carries a more forceful economic impact because you're not just isolating from the U.S. financial uh, system, but also the international financial system, and so it sends a a, a strong message uh, globally. You know, when you think about, um, you know, international issues with respect to cryptocurrency, I think a big piece of it is not just on the sanctions piece, but also on the general uh, anti-money laundering uh, regime in general, right? Because cryptocurrency is, is so global, anyone anywhere can, can transact so quickly, right? And so, you know, the U.S. obviously has to have a very effective anti-money laundering, um, counter-financing of terrorism and, and sanctions compliance regime, but illicit actors are gonna to gravitate towards uh, the weakest links in the chain, right? And so if other jurisdictions are, are not as robust or not as, as effective, then naturally illicit actors are gonna gravitate there. And so it's very important from an international perspective to ensure not just that the US is doing everything it can to have an effective regime, but uh, those jurisdictions across the globe are doing the same. No, that's a great, great answer. Eric, feel free to weigh in. I mean, I, I think you hear all the time from industry about jurisdictional arbitrage and sort of the importance of having clear AML regimes, you know, even cross-border. Um, you know, any thoughts on that when it comes to advising clients? Yeah, so it, it, it is a good question. Um, when we advise clients on this specific point, the, the, the message I try to send them loud and clear is, you may have, uh, OFAC may have jurisdiction over the activity that you're doing. You need to be very cognizant of the scope of US jurisdiction and it's incredibly broad. Um, and almost always when we actually sort of get into the weeds working with a client, we find that they are, you know, they have some degree of exposure to the United States. And so in, in some ways that kind of arbitrage doesn't, um, it, it, it exists in kind of theory from what we're seeing, but less so, um, less so in practice. In addition, many of the companies that we work with are actually trying to get access to U.S. financial markets. Um, or they're trying to, you know, to, to, to access U.S. financial institutions. And so it becomes something of a, um, of a, of a again, a theoretical point versus sort of a, an applied practice point. Terrific. Yeah, no, so staying with you for a minute, because I think this goes directly to what you're talking about. Um, you know, around the Coinbase IPO recently, there was a series of articles about voluntary disclosures that Coinbase had made to OFAC. Um, voluntary disclosures are good, um, I assume. Um, but uh, if you can sort of talk a little bit about um, sort of the way voluntary disclosures work and um, sort of how you potentially advise clients around that. Yeah, so voluntary self-disclosures, it's a great, a great topic. I'm not gonna speak specifically to the, to the, the Coinbase reporting, sure. but um, 
you know, I'm, I'm also probably gonna get in trouble with Lawrence for, for saying this. Um, as a general matter, um, you know, it's, it makes a lot of sense to file voluntary self-disclosures in a situation where you think there has been um, a potential sanctions violation, right? And there are a bunch of reasons for that. One is, of course, um, you get a significant 50% cut in, in whatever a potential base penalty may be. Um, it also likely uh, affects OFAC's thinking about whether or not to pursue, for example, public enforcement activity um, against a company. And in addition to that, it also serves, you know, frankly, a, a national security purpose because you're able to sort of identify um, a potentially uh, sanctionable interest or a potentially sanctioned activity that you then, in theory, would, uh, would remediate or stop. So it sort of closes up a potential gap. Um, with that being said, um, sometimes or, or, you know, every when I'm in discussions with clients about filing VSDs, I really do urge um, caution in filing them and making sure that um, the clients have everything really buttoned up. Um, uh, their compliance program is in good shape. There's nothing else out there within their compliance program that could expose them to significant risk, or if there is, that they get that cleaned up as well. Um, and the reason I say that is, you know, every time I file something with a regulator like Lawrence, you know, my, my, my blood pressure rises a little bit, I get a little bit of anxiety, just because I know that at the end of the day, you know, OFAC is, is there to try to help people, help firms comply with sanctions. And the, the vast majority of investigations that they do result in, in no action or no public action. At the same time, there always is a little bit of risk. Um, and so what I will advise clients when thinking about a voluntary self-disclosure, if they think there's been a violation is, well, what's the scope? Um, you know, how, what's the value of the potential violation? You know, how, how buttoned up is your compliance program? So on and so forth. So there really are a, quite a range of factors that, you, that go into to making the decision whether or not to voluntarily self-disclose. But at the end of the day, I do agree with your, your initial statement and your initial sentiment that yes, filing VSDs as uh, voluntary self-disclosures is, is overall a good thing. It helps, helps companies and it helps US national security interests as well. No, that's an, awesome, I, that's an awesome answer. Yeah, please go. Yeah. I, I would just add, just speaking generally about voluntary, voluntary self-disclosures, obviously, as, as sort of Eric noted, we, we, we encourage voluntary self-disclosures. As Eric noted, um, it's an automatic reduction in the base penalty. It's a factor we consider. Um, and so that is obviously, you know, an incentive to file a voluntary self-disclosure, because if we find out a different way, then, you know, it, it could be a different outcome. But there's, there was a point there that Eric made that I do want to emphasize, which is the vast majority of our enforcement actions and in a non-public way, whether it's a no action letter or a cautionary letter, the vast majority are non-public. It's really only a small percentage that, that end up as a public matter uh, involving a settlement or a civil monetary penalty. So I, I think that is important for, for folks to keep in mind. Really, really, really helpful. Um, so before we go, and um, Eric stole my thunder on this, but um, what we always do at TRM Talks is we bust out the crystal ball. Uh, and I'd love some, uh, love some additional predictions, maybe some more that are sort of like a little bit edgier this time, Eric. Uh, so, uh, so Lawrence, obviously, um, you know, we've seen a lot of movement um, really getting more sophisticated around crypto from OFAC, um, from sort of putting the addresses in the sanctions uh, packages through sort of enforcement actions against uh, crypto businesses. What's next? Um, you know, what, what do you sort of see down the road? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and Eric can probably be edgier than I can. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but when I think of sort of where we're going in the crypto space as it relates to sanctions, I sort of have three categories in mind, right? First is the targeting, right? We talked a little bit about that in, in connection with um, the Russian actors you mentioned, but really we're gonna continue to focus on targeting illicit activities, sanctions evasion in this space, right? It's gonna remain a top priority uh, for us. And this includes the use of digital currency by block persons, people in sanctioned jurisdictions, um, and those that, that seek to use it to evade sanctions, right? We're gonna, we're gonna continue targeting that. On the compliance and enforcement side, you know, we're, we're, we're going to continue to be very focused on ensuring that those operating in this space understand that the obligations apply to them. And we also want to make sure that they understand what those obligations are. So from an enforcement perspective, you've seen we've taken a couple cases just in the last five months, expect that to continue. Um, and, but really from the compliance side, we, we want to offer guidance and provide clarity as much as we can. 
which sort of gets into sort of the third category, which I think is private sector engagement, right? We really do want to hear from those that are on the front lines that are, that are seeing the threats, that are experiencing uh, whatever the challenges are, um, compliance or otherwise, we want to hear about those because we're always looking for ways to identify, you know, where is additional clarity, where, where is additional clarity needed? Where is additional guidance needed? Um, we really want to hear from, from those that are on the front lines because, it's, it is true that, that the success of our sanctions depends on effective implementation on the front lines. And so we want to be doing everything we can to ensure that, that uh, those in the industry get it right. So that's going to be a continued focus for us as well. I know there are a lot of people listening out there who, are going to, who would like to take you up on that offer uh, to engage from the private sector. I know Eric- More than probably, welcome. <laughs> Eric is probably one of those people. But yeah, no, I agree. Honestly, like I think when all of us were at Treasury and obviously Lawrence is still there, uh, there was a huge focus on pushing out information, whether it was in the form of FAQs or advisories and, um, and, and, and private sector engagement. I think it's, I, I would, I agree, it's, it's critically important. Um, Eric, kicking, kicking over to you for some predictions about, about what's next. What are the things that you're going to be advising your clients or really starting to think about when it comes to advising your clients? Yeah. Um, so I think the biggest thing that we are sort of focused on um, and, and thinking about is decentralized finance. Because in many ways, from a sanctions perspective, it, it presents something of a, of a challenging conundrum or a challenging target. So as a, as a step back, um, you know, OFAC historically has really focused in a, in, a, in a big way for compliance on what we sort of think of as gatekeepers in the international financial system. Um, so, for example, international global banks, right, or global banks. Obviously, um, uh, they see a lot of transactions, and so to the extent that you're able to incentivize compliance among those those you know global banks, then you can actually have outsized impacts um, across the international financial system to detect, disrupt, and, and deter illicit activity and movement by um, you know the sanctioned sanctioned actors moving funds. Likewise, in totally different category, the shipping industry has been a big focus within OFAC and within the US government over the last couple of years for that same reason, right? It's sort of this, this gatekeeper function of international commerce. So if you make uh, shipping companies uh, compliant or you incentivize compliance, then in theory, uh, they will have sort of ripple impacts across um, uh, global trade to, to create greater degrees of sanctions compliance. With decentralized finance, it's not clear to me what that sort of gatekeeper is, who that function is, right? If, if all you're talking about is a smart contract and there are you know, multiple buyers on either side and the only person who has sort of visibility initially is maybe the software developer, um, but they don't have visibility into the actual transactions that take place, it's not clear to me how a sanctions compliance program would work in that situation or how OFAC is going to think about um, potentially, you know, targeting or, or potential enforcement activity or compliance activity. So in my mind, the, the sort of continued evolution of products and services in this space and the fast evolution of products and services in the space is going to be an area that, that we're all really going to need to, to keep a close watch on. And of course, I'm looking at Lawrence right now as I'm saying this, you know, pleading, pleading with him for, for guidance in the future as, um, as this area continues to develop. Yeah, an amazing answer on such a hot topic right now. And, you know, really, how do sanctions look in a world without intermediaries is the, uh, is the question. And it's really a really interesting one. I have been meaning to do a TRM talks on DeFi. So Eric, maybe you'll uh, come back and hang out. That would, be, uh, that, would, that would be awesome. Guys, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for taking the time. This was really extraordinary. And, you know, look, I, I think people are thinking about economic sanctions all the time. Um, whether there is a foreign policy tool or how to build a compliance program around them. And this was an incredibly uh, helpful conversation. So thank you again for joining TRM Talks. Awesome. Thank great you, guys. You've been both. great. And thank you all for joining us today on TRM Talks. TRM Talks is brought to you by TRM Labs, the leading provider of blockchain intelligence on a mission to keep the financial system safe for billions of people. Looking forward to another terrific discussion next month with movers and shakers from the world of cryptocurrency. Until then, thank you to all of you who work so hard to keep us safe.